little off on my time estimate. I apologize. Thank you, Lord. Okay. So this case came today to be heard uh, for the sentencing of the defendant, Redonda Leanne Vault, on her conviction following a jury trial of impaired adult abuse, a Class C felony in violation of TCA 716-119, and criminally negligent homicide, a Class E felony in violation of TCA 3913-212. In determining the appropriate sentence for this offense, this court has considered the evidence presented at trial and the sentencing proceeding today. The pre-sentence investigation report in all corrections and additions to that report, the sentencing considerations outlined in TCA 4035-103, the nature and characteristics of the criminal conduct involved, the evidence and information offered on enhancing and mitigating factors, the defendant's statement here at sentencing, and the defendant's potential for rehabilitation or treatment. From all of this, the court finds as follows. The parties have agreed that the defendant is a range one standard offender pursuant to Tennessee Code Annotated 4035-105, subject to a sentence range of three to six years at 30% release eligibility for a Class C felony, which is the impaired adult abuse conviction, and one to two years at 30% release eligibility for a Class E felony which is the criminally negligent homicide conviction. <clears throat> By statute, this court is required to impose a sentence within those ranges. In making that determination, the court is required to consider but is not bound by two guidelines. Number one, the minimum sentence within the range of punishment is the sentence that should be imposed because the General Assembly set the minimum length of sentence for each felony class to reflect the relative seriousness of each criminal offense in the felony classifications. And two, the sentence length within the range should be adjusted as appropriate by the presence or absence of mitigating and enhancement factors as set out in Tennessee Code Annotated 4035.113 and 114. So with those considerations in mind, the court has considered evidence supporting statutory enhancement and mitigating factors. The state proposes that enhancement factor number 14, that the defendant abused a position of public or private trust is applicable. Ordinarily, this circumstance applies in situations in which a defendant has a specific or unique access that permits the commission of an offense. Examples of those types of cases are sexual offenses committed by caretakers, which was a situation in State versus Kissinger, which was the state, the case cited by the state at argument. Other situations include uh, in, where a defendant has access to internal records or accounts and uses that access to commit financial uh, offenses or forgeries. State versus Franklin, 919 Southwest 2nd, 362 in State versus Finch, 465 Southwest 3rd, 584 are examples of those types of situations. <clears throat> Application in those types of contexts and the use of the term abuse in the enhancement factor itself suggests to the court that a higher level of culpability then simple criminal negligence is required to meet the standard and thus does not find that fa the, this particular enhancement factor applicable to count two, uh, criminally negligent homicide. As to count one, impaired adult neglect, the court also declines to apply the factor because the caregiver or trust relationship is an essential element of the offense and may not be duplicated through enhancement. The court has also considered certain mitigating factors. 
and has heard proof on those today. The defense first proposes application of factor number 11, that the defendant, although guilty of a crime, committed the offense under such unusual circumstances that it is unlikely that a sustained intent to violate the law motivated the criminal conduct. The court agrees that this factor is applicable here. This offense occurred in a medical setting. It was not motivated by any intent to violate the law, but through oversight and gross negligence and neglect, as the jury concluded. The defendant also accepted responsibility immediately. She made every effort in the moment that she recognized her error to remedy the situation, to notify the appropriate uh, individuals, and then later to ensure that all of the facts and details were brought to light. The court has also heard proof today on the catch-all enhancement factor, factor number 13, and finds several circumstances applicable under that provision. First, the court observes that the defendant's acceptance of responsibility immediately and her remorse throughout this proceeding support application of factor 13. Testimony and letters from friends and colleagues attesting to her work ethic, her character, her kindness and generosity also support application of this factor. The court has also considered the fact that Ms. Vaught will never again be in a position to repeat this fatal error. She has been stripped of her nursing license and has started a new livelihood outside of the healthcare profession. All of these factors and considerations support the application of, catch -all, of the catch-all mitigating circumstance number 13. <clears throat> The court has also considered the Murphy family and their terrible loss. Nothing that happens here today can reverse that loss or ease that pain. And I have seen from my own experience, not only on the bench, but in my previous practice experience, that sometimes it seems that the attention in criminal cases tends to shift as the case goes on from the victim to the offender. In this particular proceeding, the attention is obviously on Ms. Fault because I have to determine the appropriate uh, punishment and result and outcome from the jury verdict. But I want to assure the Murphy family that this court is deeply mindful and sorry for their loss. It is my hope that changes in the practices and protocols in the medical setting that have arisen since this event may at least be some positive aspect that has arisen and that going forward, I hope that it prevents this type of situation from happening again. I recognize, however, that that will never be enough to heal your wounds. Considering the applicable mitigating factors here and the absence of any applicable enhancement factors, the court will, as to each, well, will, as to count one, impaired adult abuse, set the sentence at three years. As to count two, the court sets the sentence at two years for criminally negligent homicide. This is the maximum amount of time allowable by law that this court would be allowed to impose for criminally negligent homicide. And the court does so in recognition of the terrible loss sustained by the Murphy family. These terms will run concurrently, there being no evidentiary 
or statutory basis in this case for consecutive sentencing. So the sentence in this case will be an effective three-year sentence. The court has also considered whether to grant or deny alternative sentencing. The law requires that the court consider alternative sentencing regardless of whether it's requested. And by statute, the court has to consider a number of specific elements. The court has done that. The court finds that the defendant's potential for rehabilitation is great. The court further finds that the defendant will likely abide by the terms of probation based upon the testimony before the court, based upon the information in the pre-sentence report, which places her uh, uh, chance of, of recidivism as low and the need for uh, uh, intensive supervision as low. The court finds that the defendant is not likely to reoffend. As I stated earlier, she's no longer in a medical setting. She no longer possesses a nursing license. The court also does not find <clears throat> that a probationary sentence will unduly depreciate the seriousness of the offense. The proof at trial and the proof here at this sentencing uh, demonstrated, I think, that Ms. Vault is well aware of the seriousness of the offense. She immediately and consistently accepted responsibility for her actions, and she credibly expressed remorse in this court. The more <clears throat> challenging issue for the court has been the question of judicial diversion. Specifically, whether the defendant is even eligible for diversion with respect to count one. The defendant in this case was charged and convicted for a violation of Tennessee Code Annotated 716-119. The offense was committed in 2017. On May 24, 2019, Governor Bill Lee signed into law Chapter 2019 Public Acts Chapter 474. That act was entitled the Elderly and Vulnerable Adult Protection Act of 2019. With respect to Title 71, the act amended Tennessee Code Annotated 716-124, which is, addresses a circumstance that's unrelated to this case. But notably, the act expressly, and I quote, deleted in their entireties sections 716.117 and 716.119, the provision under which the defendant was convicted here. <clears throat> Those crimes in 716.117 and 716.119 no longer exist. They were replaced by new offenses that are similar, but they are not the same. Tennessee Code 716.119 is no longer excluded from diversion under Tennessee Code Annotated 4035.313. Perhaps that it was the intention of the legislature that it still be excluded, but it was not by the plain language of the statute. The legislature was surely aware of TCA 4071.6.119 when it amended 4035.313 and when it adopted 
the Elderly and Vulnerable Adult Protection Act of 2019, and it could have kept that code section in the list, among the list of excludable offenses in 4035.313, but it did not. And this court does not have the authority to look behind the plain language of the statute and try to glean an intent that is not expressly stated in the statute. The court thus concludes that an offense under Tennessee Code 716119 is no longer disqualifying for purposes of diversion. Again, whether that was an oversight or a mistake or whatever the intention of the legislature was, the legislature speaks through its acts, and this court can't second guess or go behind the plain language. The defendant has requested diversion for both offenses in this case. And the court has considered the factors set out in state versus electroplating, 990 Southwest 2nd, 211. The factors that the court are required to consider in determining whether to grant a judicial diversion are the accused amenability to correction, the circumstances of the offense, the accused criminal record, the accused social history, the accused physical and mental health, the deterrence value to the accused as well as others, and whether judicial diversion will serve the interests of the public as well as the accused. With respect to the circumstances of the offense, the court finds that there was no sustained intent to violate the law. and that the defendant is highly amenable to correction. She has no criminal record. She's been removed from the health care setting. She will never practice nursing again. This situation will never be repeated by Ms. Vault. The court is particularly concerned about the deterrent, or has looked most carefully at the deterrence value to the accused as well as others and whether judicial diversion will serve the interests of the public as well as the accused. The court does not find that a denial of diversion will in any way undermine any deterrence. In fact, there is no deterrence value by denying, deterrence in this, by denying diversion in this case. This was a terrible, terrible mistake. And there have been consequences to the defendant. Serious personal consequences, financial consequences, professional consequences, and now public consequences in a criminal setting. The court also does not find that judicial diversion would in any, would in any way undermine public interest. <clears throat> Again, this is not a situation that involved any sustained intent. And changes, modifications, responses that have occurred as a result will certainly serve a greater value in preventing a reoccurrence than by denial of diversion in this case. The court therefore finds that judicial diversion is appropriate and will enter an order today placing the defendant on supervised probation for an effective period of three years and will defer entry of judgment pending su successful completion of that probation. And that will be the order of the court. All rise. Court stands adjourned until Wednesday morning at 9 a.m.